Hi, I'm Jay Tyler. In this video, we're going to be talking about the Adams clasp. I'm going to show you some variations from the basic design, and then I'm going to show you a simple way to make an Adams clasp using a pair of three pronged pliers. Here's a basic Adams clasp. It's on an upper appliance. It's also got a ball clasp and a labial bow and a screw. This is a Schwartz appliance, but we're just going to be talking about the Adams clasp. Now the Adams clasp, the active part of it, are these two loops. There's one on the mesial and one on the distal here. And it's got a bar across, which makes it real handy, where you can put your finger in there and pull up on the appliance and dislodge it. Now the purpose of any clasp is to hold the posterior portion of the appliance in place. And the Adams clasp uh, is a very good mechanism for that. Uh, the Adams clasp also crosses the occlusal twice on either side of whatever molar it's on, which is a bit of a disadvantage because there's more opportunity to bite on a wire. So the Adams clasp fits into the undercut. Here's the model, and we'll fit that on in a minute. But first, let's talk about what undercut is. Uh, when you have a molar, that you're putting a clasp on, if you were to draw a line down parallel with the long axis, you would find a point where you meet the crest of the curvature. And the crest of the curvature is also called the height of contour. Now, undercut occurs just gingival to that. So this would be the undercut area here, and over here, it would be down here. So it depends on the curvature of the tooth where the undercut will occur. And what you want a clasp to do, and the Adams clasp is no exception, you want it to fit just gingival to the height of contour or the crest of curvature. Now if you had it way down here, that means that the clasp would have to spring way out to get in here and you could take a chance on bending that wire because it has to bend so far out to get over the height of contour. But if it's just below, then it just barely bends out and it just snaps right into place. Now, if we take this model that I've bent this Adams clasp on and we were to uh, survey it, I don't, I'm not going to put it on a surveyor, but I'm just going to draw a, a line here, drag my pencil along this and we'll try, we're trying to identify where the height of contour might be. Okay, so you can see there's going to be some undercut right in here, and uh, not much back here, but a little bit. Uh, let me just drag that back here a little bit better. Uh, yeah, there's not much back there. There's more on the mesial than on the distal. So let's do the same thing on this. Okay, so I've got some good undercut there and a little bit back here. Now, when I put this appliance on, and we look at it, we see that these little loops fit right into here and right into here. And let's look and see. And yep, that's, that's gingival to the height of contour. Now that line that I drew may not be that accurate. And back here, it's not so much. But when you look right down on the tooth, it, it's doing the best it can. Uh, now, I've cut out that interdental papilla some to uh, expose uh, just below where the uh, free gingiva is, gotten rid of the free gingiva. And uh, so uh, the clasp will fit in there, uh, go down and get as much undercut as possible. Now, when I look at this one and I snap it down, that's definitely into the undercut. And it's into this little bit of undercut right there. That's ideally where you want it. That's uh, just a little bit, maybe too far down. But, um, this wire I have is such a good wire, it can withstand that a bit of spring right there. But I probably would adjust that so it's not quite as deep into, into the undercut there. All right, that's the basic principles of the, um, of the Adams clasp. Now there's some variations of this, and I'm going to go over some of those. I've seen the Adams clasp like this, where it's just right straight across, where you have no curvature of these loops. Uh, this is, and then I've seen them where they're just the opposite. They're parallel with one another. And then this is the one like I just showed you. So there's different variations and there's probably more and you can post your variations if you like. And uh, let's just talk about them. So this one that goes straight across. I ran into this recently and uh, the person telling me about this design was just saying this is a really wonderful design, but as I look at it and I put it on this molar, this lower molar here, I'm just wondering what the advantage is because I see that the 
just half of, you know, just part of the loop is engaging into the undercut. And it seems to me like it would be better if the entire loop, like, you know, like if it was right there, instead of this, if it was like right there, there'd be more contact of the loop into the undercut. But um, write a post. Tell me what, what I'm missing here, if I'm missing out on something. Okay, now here's the one that's like this. Let's say that, well, let's go to this one first. Okay, let's say that this one, this tooth has no undercut whatsoever. So if we put this in here like this, like we just did on the upper, well, it's not going to have anything to hold on to. It's just not going to go into anything. But if you had a design like this, then all of a sudden these become like little arrow clasp, where they are kind of like a, the action of a ball clasp, where it fits into the embrasure. You can almost always find some undercut in the embrasure. So it's not depending just on the molar itself. It's depending on the embrasure between the second bicuspid and the molar. So that would fit in there like that, and that would be some good undercut. So those are the basic principles of it. Now, if you're bending a lower, it's important that you take into consideration the upper cusps. So with the bar that goes across on the lower doesn't need to be interfering with the opposing cusps because the buckle cusp on the upper overlap the buckle surface on the lower. So this bar would need to be below that, like right in this area right here. All right, now I'm going to show you an easy way to bend this basic form. And then you can have, from, from the basic form, you can have it this way, or this way, or this way. It's up to you. And then the amount of closure on the loops, that's up to you too. Some people uh, like to close them in some designs real tightly, uh, like that. And some like to have them a little more open. That one's pretty tight. And um, let's see, that one's a little more open. So whatever you want to do. But let's just um, say that right here, I want to have the loop. Let's say I want to have the loop go right here and right here. So if I'm going to do that, then uh, let me get my wire here. Now, the wire I use is a nickel chromium wire. It doesn't have a whole lot of elasticity. It's got some. It's fairly springy. But it's got a great deal of tensile strength. Now, tensile strength and elasticity are inversely proportional to one another, so you can't have both. You can't have great elasticity and great tensile strength. You have to give one up. But for a clasp, I would rather have good tensile strength. And this nickel, uh, I mean, this chromium alloy wire is a very durable wire. You can bend that wire a whole bunch before it breaks. So I like that wire very much for this. It's also malleable, so even when you bite on it some, uh, it's not going to break it. Now I'm going to mark, like right here and right here, where I want those loops to be. Now, I just take a very simple, easy way to do that is to take a three, pair of three-prong pliers, and I'll put it on that first mark, and I'm going to bend it down, I'm going to bend it back, and then I'm going to flip the plier, put it in the loop, and bend down again. So I get this basic form like that. Okay, I'm going to go over here and bend it down, bend it back, flip the pliers, and go back down. So I end up with this right here. Okay, you say, well, that's, that's not the Adams class, but now I'm going to take my pair of bird beak pliers and I'm going to just grab it right here and I'm going to bend it in and as I do I'm going to bend it up end and up at the same time and what I'm doing is I'm closing that loop a little bit and I'm putting that angle that I want now if you're just going straight across you would just bend it straight up if you're bending it where they're parallel to one another you would bend it all the way around but I'm bending it in and up now I can go ahead and rotate these in, these ends in, and if I want to tighten this up a little bit, I just go in here and give it a little extra. But the basic form is made with the three prong pliers. Now I use the three pair, the three prong pliers sparingly because they put little dents in the wire. But for a durable wire like this, with a clasp like this, it, it works really well. So there you have. And now it needs to be dressed up some, but there you have the very basic form of the Adams clasp.
So as you can see, it really depends on the anatomy of the tooth what variation of Adams class you use. Now if you're new to the field, or just getting started, or you're training someone who is new, I have a DVD program for you. It's called Orthodontic Laboratory Basics. It's designed to teach people how to make basic orthodontic appliances. You can check it out on our website. That's ortholabvideos.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.